Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. Our guest this morning speaks to this word that I absolutely love. And if you've watched the show at all, you know it's that word called possibility. Her name is Anna O'Brien. And when many thought that she would not have any success in life, she proved them wrong, and she continues to prove them wrong. She has a master's degree from Columbia University, where she studied quantitative methods in social sciences. Over the past decade, she has built a professional career on innovation and creative problem solving. You may have also seen her in the Gillette ad. Well, she joins us this morning from New York City to talk about her newly released book entitled A Life Full of Glitter, A Guide to Positive Thinking, Self-Acceptance, and Finding Sparkle in a Sometimes negative world. Anna, good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So Anna, your book and your life kind of reads like a novel. And <laughs> <laughs> but, but it does. It speaks to all of our possibility, no matter what our challenges and shortcomings seem to be. I want you to take us back to that young girl who was angry and basically, um, parents couldn't really do a whole lot with you. Yeah. So when I grew up, my mom was really, really sick. And a lot of the time that my family had was really dedicated to dealing with her illness. As a result, I kind of was like left by myself and I was angry and I was hurt and I felt unseen. And I think a lot of us feel unseen in life. This is not an unusual feeling for people to feel, but as a kid growing up in that, that emotion was really hard. Mm -hmm. And I started to act out, you know, I wanted attention. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was a bad kid. I don't know any other way to say it. I was violent. I was angry. I was inappropriate. And I think a lot of people looked at me and like literally were like, it'll be all be okay when she's in jail. And I hate to say that, but that's literally what people thought of me. They had completely and totally given up on me. Um, and in a lot of ways, I'd given up on myself by letting myself get to this point. And so when you look back on that little girl, that young lady, that tween and teen that was crying out for attention, did you know at the time that you just wanted somebody to notice you? No. I don't think I realized that at all. And I think that was the hardest part of it because I think if I did, I would have maybe had better choices in how to be recognized. I think, you know, one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is recognizing why you feel some way. A lot of us make decisions because we feel hurt or upset, but we never actually target why we feel that way. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening, I'm sorry, there's a siren. That's going okay. By. That's New York well, city. To New York city. <laughs> Um, we don't actually acknowledge or recognize why we're feeling that way. So we come up with solutions to problems that are not actually the real problem, but something that's sitting on the surface that's masking the harder and uglier and deeper feeling that's underneath. And, and so this problem continues where you're just um, irreverent. I mean, you are just um, beyond yeah. what your parents, what your family can deal with. And so they sort of send you away. Yeah. So I was sent to a special school. I'm not exactly sure what they're called today, but their uh, severe emotional disability is what it was called in my time, SED courses. And it's so when, when they make that decision, Anna, tell me about what, what that does to, to a, to a spirit that's already bruised and broken. And, you know, it almost, it, in, in the book, yeah. it almost feels like you feel like you're being thrown away. It is like being thrown away. I'm not going to cry. Actually, I probably will. But um, I did. I felt I felt that sadness because it was obvious that you were you were you needed that attention. And and our parents, our folks do the best that they can. And, yeah. you know, there were so many things going on in your family and they just didn't have the bandwidth to agree to, to stop. Um, it was really hard. It was really, really hard. I had to go to a school about an hour away. I was in a classroom with kids that had all very similar issues to me, some more severe, some less severe. Many of them were in uh, group homes or juvenile detention centers outside of school. So it was not only um, being in a situation that felt like people had given up, it was also being surrounded by a bunch of people who also felt the exact same way 
And it was like a class of hopelessness. And I think in the education system, uh, a lot of people think that this is the solution to the problem. But I don't, I don't know if I had to go back to it. I don't think it's very motivating to be a bunch of kids that people have given up on and put them together so they can realize collectively that we're the failures. Mm. We're the failures that they just have to deal with until we're 18. Wow. But this too shall pass and you got beyond it. But I not did. before, not before quitting high school. So um, it kind of, the, the, the narrative kind of actually goes where I did get out of the class and into normal high school, but it was just, it didn't work, right? I had been broken by the system, to be very honest, um, because I wasn't used to normal human interaction, being in a room with people that extremely overreacted to everything. Um, an example of such is, and I think I write about it in the book, I, I remember sitting at my desk in this SED program, and there was a kid across from me, and he was just repeatedly hitting himself in the face, like not just like a tap, but like a punch in the face. And to the left of me, there was someone being wrestled to the floor for trying to attack a teacher. And I just sitting there and I'm like, this, this, there has to be more than this. This has to be the future. So I did improve my behavior a little bit in high school um, and was able to go what they call mainstreaming, which is where they take someone in that program and put them back into high school. But then when I was in high school, I didn't have the skills to interact with people appropriately because I'd been in this world that was so far away from normalcy that when you, you know, get mainstreamed back into the system, you don't have the same maturity, the same skill sets, the same friend groups to help you survive. And so I just kind of was like, I'm done, right? <laughs> like I'm done. Hmm. And so I walked away from it. Um, and I felt like I had changed as an individual but the world around me hadn't seen that change. And so I kind of, part of the reason I left high school, which is ironic, is this perspective of I needed to go somewhere where people didn't see me as a failure, like where I could literally start over a little bit and have the opportunity to reframe the narrative around who I was, not only in other people's minds, but also in my own mind. Because when you're in an environment where every single person is telling you, you are this, and you can never be more than this, it's very hard for you to mentally fight against that. Now, as I've matured and grown up and gone through a lot of challenges since then, I can do that now. But as like a 16 year old, no, no shot. Like there was no way I was going to be able to do that without, you know, putting myself in a new position. And, and that's what I did. Absolutely. Let's get a break here, Anna. But when we come back, we'll talk more about changing our thinking i.e. changing our mind. The book is entitled A Life Full of Glitter. Stay on point. We're back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. Our guest this morning is Anna O'Brien, and she is really working to change the way that we think and to help all people who will read this book or come in contact with her blog, that possibility exist for all, no matter what your circumstances. Her book is entitled A Life Full of Glitter, A Guide to Positive Thinking, Self-Acceptance and Finding Sparkle in a Sometimes Negative World. And, and the world has gotten really overly negative. And one of the things that you write about, you're very open in the book, is you write about your weight and the bullying and the challenges. Mm -hmm. How were you able Anna, to get by it, to be a person that sparkles and allows your spirit to shine? So one thing I've realized um, is that we are taught so often that how we physically look limits what we're able to do in life. And I had been told my entire life that I was limited, right? We just talked about how everybody gave up on me. Right. So what I decided in that very critical point in my life, when I was able to turn that around, that I could turn anything around. So instead of believing this potential that, you know, instead of believing this perspective that I had to give up because I was, you know, plus size or whatever, uh, I decided instead to do everything I wanted to do anyway. And if I failed, I failed, but at least I tried. What that does, that perspective of, to your point, possibility, 
what it opens up is this imaginary place where you can sp- play and get to know yourself, right? And confidence and uh, ability to be resilient really comes from knowing who you are. It's not about knowing how people see you. But how did you figure out who you were? How did you get the courage to do that? Because everybody was saying bad, bad, yeah. bad, they, bad. You go to the back of the line because you are bad. How do you find the courage to find what's really the gifting that really lives in you? So the thing that I always recommend for people to start with, and it's where I really started, is to start playing around with things you enjoy. Um, developing hobbies and skills and how people see you. But how- it's not until we start acknowledging what we do have uh, that we can move past and fight against those things that people say we don't have, right? So your perspective of bad, 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 I needed to find ways that I was good. So it was things like volunteering in my community. It was things like developing skills and interests that I had, knowing who I was. I think a lot of times when we talk about personal development, it often starts with like, I'm going to lose weight. Like that's like the magical solution. And if you talk to someone who's lost a lot of weight and this is no shame, I think everybody makes the best decisions for their body. They can, but a lot of times what happens is these women will lose weight and it won't solve the issues of feeling inadequate. And that's because when you allow the world around you to shape who you are, you are giving up an immense part of your power to develop and be the best you can because you will only be able to be what the people around you think you're putting. But there's that pressure. There's that pressure from society that, that, that says, you know, you're going to be better. You're going to be healthier. You know, you're going to, you're, you're going to be more available to what the world has for you if, and when you lose weight and, and, and somebody that that's overweight, that's what most people want to say. What are you doing to try to lose weight? Yeah. And I just like to talk to them about something else. There's a great PR tactic where you just change the narrative. You answer the question you want to hear versus answering the question that someone gives you. So if somebody asks me, you know, what are you doing to lose weight? I said, you know what I really am enjoying doing right now? And I just tell them about what I'm enjoying doing. Mm -hmm. I think when people get to know me, a lot of their narrative of what a plus size person is changes because We also have an archetype that we present for plus size women, that they're lazy, that they're sit at home, that they're not social, that they're not talented, that they don't work as hard as other people, that they're unclean and unkempt. And then they meet me and I am none of those things. You are a diva. I am a little bit of a diva. I love being outside. (laughs) A diva in a good way. In a good way. I'm a positivity diva. Mm -hmm. But I think the reality is is most plus women aren't that way, but they become that way because they've allowed themselves to be shaped by the narrative that's going around weight. Now I want to be very clear. I don't advocate for any body type over the other. What I advocate for is that we are all in very different bodies and our goal and our, you know, thing that we should really be pursuing is how to be, be the best person we can be in the body we have now. Now that body may change and adapt to support you better. That's okay. But that doesn't mean you have to hate yourself in that process as well. Mm -hmm. And don't you think that that's what happens more often than not? I've talked to people who have lost a hundred plus pounds and who have been overweight their whole lives and they still see themselves overweight though they have lost a hundred plus pounds. Totally. I mean, I hear that all the time and it's funny because people always say things, wouldn't you be happier if you were thin? I was like, I actually don't think I would be happier. There'd be some things about my life that would be easier and I'm not going to pretend that they wouldn't be, but my happiness is really not tethered to that. I really don't look at it and go, you know, when I hit this magical goal, then I have worth. In fact, even the way our brain works, that's not how our brain works. When we start identifying ourselves as something, and I talk a little bit about this in the book, that's how we actually progress to it. So if you, thin is actually not an achievable thing because it's an adjective, right? And it's mm. all relative. So it's it's not an attainable goal. It's a descriptor. Just like health, the word health, being healthy is not actually obtainable. Even the World Health Organization has said, we can't have an absolute factor for health because there's all these things that go around health that we can't control. We don't know what your genetics are or your environment or what chemicals we're exposed to today, what effect they'll have in 20 years. What we can do is make choices that are healthier, right? Right. So it's all about reframing the narrative from this, like 
view of absolutes to doing the best you can. We talked a little bit about this, you know, personally down the side. The reality is, is when we say something is or is not one thing, we also limit the possibility that our current understanding is not the full picture, right? Absolutely. So if I took myself as a kid and said, you're a bad kid, that's an absolute, right? That limits my potential for a lot of people that would be limiting. But because I decided to kind of do away with this like absolute perspective, it's very like has changed my life. Was there Even a moment, but was there a moment, Anna, because I, I stick out that you are the exception and not the rule mm -hmm. with everything that you describe in the book that you went through as a child and quitting high school and not feeling accepted by the friend groups and, all, you know, so many young people and even older people face these challenges, but don't, is there a, is there a seminal moment when you decide I am not, I am not who they say that I am. These are the things that I did, but this is not who I am. You know, that's a hard question to answer. I can't say whether I'm the exception or I'm the everyday person, but I, what I can tell you is I've worked with a lot of kids, a lot of with, you know, what I do on social media. And I've seen being exposed to different role models, being exposed to people that teach them to explore who they are, has fundamentally changed their lives and has taken away a lot of that doubt. So I think a lot of it is the seminal moments in our life was going to be different for every single person. But the first step is A, recognizing your emotions and B, being open to those opportunities. One of the things I talk about a little bit in the book is this perception of thinking you are worthy of an opportunity. Um, we are trained to think that we are not lucky and we use this word luck all the time. And there's been a lot of research on luck and luck is 95% of mind state because people who believe they are lucky are more likely to recognize opportunities than people who don't believe they're lucky. So by all intents and purposes, the lucky being lucky, uh, being lucky is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think you're lucky, you will be. Absolutely. If you think you're unlucky, you won't be. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is the first stage of recognizing that you have opportunity, period. Right? Like regardless of where you are in your stage, whether it's that opportunity is this huge, amazing thing or this small little thing, recognizing that you are worthy, and we talk a lot about worth, mm -hmm. is really about the, the first step. And I think our current narrative about worth is that it is a, a finite resource. Right. That there's only a little bit of worth in the world and we're all having to take everybody else's worth to get our worth. And the reality is worth is an infinite resource. And I when you start that. thinking about this idea of everybody can have worth, everybody can gain worth, everybody can have more worth, you don't need to take somebody else's worth to have worth, then you start to see the change in, in perspective. These are all easy things to say on this show. It's easy for me to tell you if you start looking at your own worth, you're going to feel better. Yes, it's a process. It's easy to say, but, but you haven't just talk the talk, you've walked the walk. And I think that yeah. that makes you the perfect person to talk about it and to talk about the possibility that we can all do it if we make that decision. Hold that thought. We're going to take a break here, but when we come back, we're going to talk about how you turned your hobby into an incredible empire, really. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Stay on point. We're back after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. Anna and I are having so much commentary offset that is just, it's incredible. Her book is entitled A Life Full of Glitter. And the book, the title could really be deceiving, Anna, because you really go into some hard places in your life. You give a lot of research and the book it takes the reader into your head and into how smart you really are in terms of figuring out these things that could have held you bondage. Why did you think that that was important to do? I really, really believe knowledge is power. And I think that this knowledge is not accessible or available to most people. And I'm a nerd. And so I did all of this research and it did empower me. It did inspire me to like really listen to who I was and to, to my own mind versus the minds around me, which we talked about is really hard. Sure. And I was like, man, if, if more people understood how our brains actually work in, in developing who we are and developing how we see the world, I think it'd be easier 
to be able to love and accept yourself because you'd understand it's all in how the brain works. And we do so many things that are totally counter our own best interest because we're just not aware. We have no clue how our body chemically processes emotions and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't use all of the shortcomings as an excuse to, to fail or to sit where you were. You use those experiences to turn them around. And after quitting high school, you are probably one of, I'm sure everybody in your sphere feels is one of the most unlikely candidates to get into Columbia. How did that happen? Um, so it's kind of an interesting story. I ended up living with a friend of the family and she was like, you should get a GED. And it's, and you know, I ended up taking the test, but that wasn't enough. I had to study for the SAT and the ACT and do all of that. And still, I had no real academic record because I technically didn't have grades. And the grades I did have were absolutely terrible because I wasn't exactly focused on academia at the time. Sure. So I went in and I wrote a presentation to there is almost every university has what's called an exceptions board uh, for people that are in usual cases. And I decided to apply to the exceptions board. I wrote all the things I learned from life experiences. And I said to them, I don't have the academic background you want. I can get that. But I can guarantee you that every student in the school probably doesn't have the life experience I have. I've, you know, seen illness. I've seen suffering. I've seen you know, issues with mental health. And I've, I've, I've found a way out of it. And all I'm asking is for you to see the same potential in me that I already know I have. Wow. And they ended up accepting me. Uh, I did have to go in an off semester. So it wasn't like I started in September. I started in, I believe, uh, the fall, the winter semester. But I got in. And uh, I did my undergraduate at BYU. And then I ended up doing my master's degree at Columbia. And, you know, every step of the way... And if you, and I don't even talk about everything in my life, but mm -hmm. one of the stories that, you know, everyone likes to joke about is when I went to get my master's degree, I just decided I was going to go to this program at Columbia. I told them I was going to do it. And I ended up meeting with the dean. I walked in and I said, I'm going to be in your, your program. Here's what I'm going to study. You're going to have me in there. And, he and you like, spoke that you, you spoke that I out, into the, said it out loud into the atmosphere and into the yeah, universe. And and I said it to him, too, and I explained to him why, why it was a good idea. I ended up getting into Columbia. Uh, they waived my GRE because they wanted me to start early. Because when people are looking at people they want to have in their teams and their career and everything else, they want people that are passionate, that know what they want. And so when you do know what you want, it's an immense power. Mm. You can do incredible things because so many people have no clue what they want in life. So when you actually fight to know and, and take the time to understand, and I talk a little bit about how to do this, you can achieve more because simply walking in and knowing what you want is the first step to getting what you want. <laughs> you can't get it if you don't know what it is. Um, and I did that multiple times in my life. I got my first big job. I, I built social media for Citibank. And uh, I walked in by going to the senior director of digital and said, you should hire me for this role. And this is why you should. And she said she'd never had anybody be so ballsy before, but she loved it because I knew what I wanted and I came prepared. Absolutely. So for those people that saw the campaign uh, that Gillette had mm -hmm. you as their model in, Tell us how that happened. So it's it's funny. I actually took that image in Cuba with a friend. We were on a beach after a rainstorm. It was actually a really wonderful moment. And Gillette saw the image and said, we really like to use this. Is that okay? And I said, totally fine. Did and they see it on your social media? Yep, they saw it on my social media. And they said, this is, I said, that's great for representation. And that's what I want. I want us to see diverse bodies for all the different types of bodies to be seen, really. So they decided to repost it, and then it led to just a deluge of commentary on my body. <laughs> That's the easiest way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, and what I found very, very interesting is a lot of the commentary around the, the incident uh, started out dangerously vile. But by the time it got to the mainstream press, was turned into promoting obesity. 
What is interesting to me is that we are so comfortable with negativity that we will make it more palatable. Hmm. So in this entire experience for me, was it great having my body out there and critiqued by strangers? <laughs> no. But was it great knowing that there's a little girl out there who saw a plus size person happy in a bikini and might actually go to the beach instead of staying home? Yeah. In fact, I got hundreds of messages from women and girls alike telling me that they were going to go to the beach this year. Wow. Women who hadn't been to the beach in 10 years said they felt empowered to go to the beach. Now think about that. Like it's such a simple thing, being able to go swim. The environment had made it. So they felt they couldn't do that. Right. Because there was this archetype that we compare ourselves to. And if we don't match that archetype, then we don't feel worthy or we don't feel beautiful. Mm -hmm. But you know what I wondered when I saw it and, and I said to our team, I said, we've got to get Anna on our show. I wondered how you, if you internalized all a lot of the meanness, because there was a lot of meanness. And mm -hmm. I knew deep down inside that there was something bigger about your story than just this one picture. So I'm not going to say that the meanness had no effect on me, because that would be an utter and complete lie. It's hard. It's hard to read negative things like that about you, and especially at such a grand scale. But what I will say is, Having been in a place where I was once a bully, I understand where that comes from. And when I look at people that are mean online, I see people that are hurting. Because I don't know any person who is happy and joyful in life who would go out of their way to take that joy and happiness from someone else. Hmm. And we, there was a lot of discussion about promoting obesity, um, which I find is always a really interesting conversation because there's literally nothing I'm doing in that image that promotes unhealthy behaviors. I'm literally getting vitamin D out doing an active activity and smiling, which is actually a, a positivity motivator. Right. However, when we see thin women who uh, are, you know, maybe on the thinner side, we never talk about that narrative. Uh, and we tend to relate my body to someone who's like, extremely anorexic to the point where it's debilitating and they're not really comparable. <laughs> it's a little hard to like even get into that conversation. Cause it's so, like we said earlier, nuanced and, and health is so personal. So I think for me, when I walked away from it, I knew, I know who I am. I know the behaviors I engage in. I know my flaws. I'm aware of my flaws. I work on my flaws. I'm by no means perfect. Well, and oh. none of us are. Before we've got to go, oh. tell us about glitter and lasers, glitters plus lasers. So glitter and lasers is kind of my world online. Uh, it started as an Instagram post that I literally did because I was working in a technology company and I created a space for me every day to just post what I was feeling. And it was almost like an accountability. It was part of the process of me just maintaining my own awareness. It was like, what do I like? Fashion. So I'm going to develop this talent and, you know, share content. Fast forward a year and a half later, um, I have a lot of followers and I have a lot of popularity and it's too much work to do both my normal job and this. So I decided what was my chance to do more for the world? And I decided that it was, you know, running in this direction fearlessly, which is also one of the things that I think makes people great is being willing to run towards fear. Hmm. So I did it. And at the same time, I ended up being able to write this book and I've, you know, done YouTube and TikTok. And now, you know, I have all this ability to impact people and to help them see that they have so much potential. That's all I want people to know is that they are so much more powerful than they realize they are. Wow. Anna, you are incredible. And, uh, I called it an empire. You call it a movement. I think the <laughs> movement will create your empire. Thank you for taking the time to share your heart and so much of the possibility that exists and potential that exists in each of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Indeed. Hey, everybody, stay on point. We're back right after this.